He heads one of India's largest software companies. He was rated among the 100 most influential people in the world by Time magazine. He was honored with the Padma Bhushan in 2005. He is Azim Premji, chairman of Wipro. All of 21 and still pursuing his electrical engineering at Stanford, Premji had to take control of Wipro after his father's sudden death. Wipro then was a company producing vegetable oil and consumer products. Premji came in as a young executive and became responsible for a transition that has created history. Under his leadership, Wipro grew from a $1.5 million consumer products company to one of the world's most respected software multinational corporations worth over $2.3 billion today. Wipro is also the world's largest independent R&D service provider and its BPO arm is the biggest outsourcing company in India. We bring you the leader and mentor of Wipro, Azim Premji, on PowerTech. Mr. Premji, thanks very much for speaking to us on CNBC TV 18. Let me start by asking you Thank an you. interesting quote that I read of yours. Apparently, when you took over the reins of the company, when you came back and you were just 21, at your first AGM, a shareholder said, Mr. Premji, you should sh sell your shareholding and give it to more mature management because there's no way a person of your age and experience can lead this company. If you were to meet that shareholder today, what would you say to him? Poor fellow's dead. So I cannot <laughs> meet him. Well, I think he has to judge us in terms of what we have achieved. And I think he was able to do that 10 years later and 15 years later. Mm -hmm. He was one of our earlier shareholders. And I think it was a good comment which he made because it really got my determination up to prove him wrong. Did you for a second consider what he had said to you? No. No. But did that, did that, was it the internal skepticism or the external skepticism that bothered you or that made you sort of want to prove a point more at that point? I think it was that? external. Mm -hmm more than internal. Internal, you know, it was a small company with a lot of loyalties to leadership. Mm -hmm. So the internal skepticism was not allowed to be present. But I think external skepticism was obviously there because it was a difficult industry, inexperienced leadership. You know, can you make a success of it or not make a success of it? When did you it was feel a that question which everyone would be asking, I suppose. So he just articulated it. Well, he articulated it. And when did you finally feel that you had found your voice, that you had found your feet in the business that you took over? Oh, maybe seven, eight years later. Yeah, it took that long? It took that long. Maybe what? I was just a slow learner. <laughs> what is the big turning point for you? I think success. Success breeds on success. Mm -hmm. Confidence of being able to get into depth. Confidence of being able to understand fundamentals when you get into depth. Confidence of being able to mobilize teams to get them to move towards a common purpose. Mm -hmm. And then seeing the end product of it in terms of commercial results because that is a key parameter for every business organization and teamwork. But did you go through any sort of formal grooming? Did your father explain the ropes to you, explain the nature of the business and the game to you? Because you were at Stanford, you were barely 21, you took over the company in circumstances that you had not imagined or contemplated. Was there any sort of formal structured grooming that had un been taken place uh, uh, before that? No. No, not at all. So you Because it was not certain that I was going to get into working with my father anyway. What would you have done so otherwise? Well, I would have liked to work if I had a choice at that point of time with the World Bank or an equivalent organization for a few years till I got my grounding and really what I wanted to do. Mm. I went for engineering because at that time for undergraduates, that was the only thing that the Reserve Bank permitted. But one broadened uh, a lot in the engineering course, which an American university gives you the benefit of. So I came out as really a generalist rather than an engineer. So we could have seen you in an economist subtar, is it? Perhaps. <laughs> well, Coming back, what was the most frustrating battle for you when you actually got into the company, when you decided to change mindsets, when you decided to diversify, turn the company from what it was into what it is today? What was the most frustrating battle for you? And you've seen several innovations along the way. Uh, what do you think has been the most critical and the most major one for you? No, I think the most frustrating thing was that we were a pure commodity company. Mm. We were in vegetable oils, you know, we were in oil seed crushing. We didn't have a brand. We sold to wholesalers. So we didn't have a channel. So it was a question of re-engineering the entire business model of the company to build a brand and to build uh, loyal and deep-rooted distribution channels which reach the consumer, not the trader. 
I think that was the most important re-engineering we had to go through with the company. And, did and to bring a measure of judgment based on science into what we bought and what we sold. But 1980 is when the technology avatar or the technology foray for Wipro really began, which wasn't really Wipro in 1945 when the company was actually established. How much of, of a gamble at that point in time did you think the technology business was going to be? Or were you quite convinced that it was something that you would that would work? You know, with? the late 70s, early 80s, diversification was the style to be in. So you know, it was very natural for people to diversify, particularly in India, because you know the markets were just opening up. Uh, so it was not unusual for a company to diversify, mm. which is different than what is the culture But today. diversify from a commodities company into a technology company? In a way, yes. You know, I mean, diversification was diversification. Uh, and we just found an opportunity had come up. What we were looking for was a technology diversification, which was in the high-tech area, and which could give us a possibility of a second service stream, mm. in addition to a product stream. And we just zeroed in on uh, computers because the opportunity was there. A leader in the market had exited the country. And we were able to put an act together. We invested a lot in R&D. We invested a lot in application software. And we were an instant hit. And uh, we, we fed on that success. And we plowed back the cash flow from the success to finally build a global software uh, export business which has been fairly successful so far. But in 1980, when you devised the blueprint, when you designed uh, the game plan for the IT business as it currently stands, within the company, did people buy into your argument? Did people buy into your logic? Or did you have to really play a sort of mental battle of trying to convince them to, to move on to your side? You know, I think what we did, and I think we did that well, is that we organized different businesses differently. Mm -hmm. We organized leadership differently. We organized teams below that leadership differently. So to a, lot, to a very large extent, the mainstream of the company was not directly involved with this diversification, which is why we were able to start with a white sheet of paper and put together a team dedicated to making this business a success and put together people both from college, from science institutes and from competition to survive in terms of the success of the business. If the How business didn't succeed, they would have not survived. But how hands-on were you right through that period? Uh, in terms of business models, in terms of people, very hands-on. Mm -hmm. In terms of technology, I left it up to people because I think they understood better than I understood it. I read a story somewhere that you would actually sit in a cycle rickshaw and visit the alleys in Chandni Chowk along with your sales team. Is that accurate? Yes, but you know, we were originally in consumer products and that's the nerve center of the company. But you actually did they this? they don't teach you in business school. I did that till about even 10, 12 years back. Then I got too visible, so I was not getting unbiased reports in the marketplace. I thought it was counterproductive then. That seems a far cry from the Azim Premji that most people seem to perceive or that most people seem to think of. There's almost an air of inaccessibility. Where do you think that's, that, no, that no, perceptions come from? I'm more to the press. I'm very accessible to everyone else. You're just inaccessible to the press. Why is I'm that? I'm less accessible to the press. Why is because that? You know, I think it's just a matter of prioritization. It's a matter of trying to project a company versus trying to project oneself. Hmm. But in, in an age of soundbite journalism, in an age where everybody in corporate India is actually out there making a pitch, not just for their companies, but making a pitch on every single, single issue possible, uh, don't you think that maybe, you know, you've lost out on the perception or the mind game in that sense? I think that's for you to judge, really. I think something is basic to one's personality. Why should one try to go against the grain? Okay. It's fundamental. Until 1999, Wipro was a $150 million company. This was the year Vivek Paul joined Wipro and became its poster boy. Industry watchers say Paul was instrumental in taking Wipro to the billion dollar mark in 2004. Paul's inorganic growth strategy helped Wipro steal the thunder from the likes of IBM and Accenture. But in a surprising turn of events, Paul quit Wipro in June 2005 and the buzz suggested his departure was a result of differences with Premji. Paul's exit was the second jolt for Wipro that year as it followed the departure of Wipro's BPO head, Raman Roy. 
one of the other things that I know Wipro internally prides itself on is the fact that you have a very entrepreneurial culture and you've gone on to produce leaders who've then gone on to do their own startups and so on and so forth. But on the other side, people sitting across the fence would also say that uh, they're forced to be entrepreneurial uh, because there is a lack of flexibility at the top and hence the high profile exits. How would you react to that? You know, I think it's a combination. Uh, if a person shoots off and becomes an entrepreneur on his own, I think he obviously has higher latitude of scope and higher latitude of freedom as compared to working in a $2 billion plus corporation. So, I mean, that's natural or inherent in the situation. But I think to our pride and to our credit, we've been able to produce people who had the guts to strike out and make a success. And some of them have failed uh, and they have tried again and they've succeeded again. And many of them who have left have come back to us. You know, we are completely open on that policy. And you can talk to virtually any one of them. They're still strong ambassadors for Wipro. And they found that the training that they got in Wipro was probably the most valuable training they ever got in their careers. So we're very proud of them. And we're not defensive about the fact that some good people have left us. We've lost some good people, we've lost some less good people. You're one of the biggest brand ambassadors, and you yourself have said it, Vivek Paul, which was the biggest sort of high-profile exit. And, and I quote you, you said he had a big role in evangelizing the Wipro and the Indian IT story in the U.S. He played a key role in building the Wipro brand in the U.S. and he brought in a global mindset, which is exactly what we needed in 1999. When Vivek Paul left, did you feel personally let down? You know, I think one comes to a stage in leadership where you try to build up a cultivated sense of insensitivity to issues. Uh, of course you feel personally let down, but you take that in your stride. I mean, any part truth, of the game. Any truth at all to the fact that he left on account of differences with you? You know, I think there are certain healthy differences which always have to be encouraged. But I think we worked reasonably well as a team. So, you know, it, it's, it's gossip to say that he left on differences. Of course, we always debated issues, we disagreed on issues. Uh, and we had to call final shots on issues. Sometimes he had his way, sometimes I had my way. I think we still worked well as a team. Are you still in touch with him? Yes. You are. Well, one of the other things that happened post Vivek Paul's exit was you once again restructured the way the leadership of the company, uh, in a sense, de layering it. People would say that that de layering has actually led to a more focused central command. How would you respond and react to that? Because that's one of the innovations that you're currently experimenting in. It's about a year and a half uh, into, uh, into its progress. No, but we did de delay the company significantly. Uh, we did uh, also change the role of corporate staff. Corporate staff used to be people sitting in the stadium throwing peanut shells. Now we made them responsible for running the business in terms of functions, whether it be human resources, whether it be finance, uh, whether it be quality, whether it be innovation. I think that's been the most significant change which we have made, which a lot of people have not noticed in terms of a significant Plus, we have empowered our presidents, uh, four of our presidents, five of our presidents, in terms of running their businesses. And I think results are showing. Uh, and, uh, our so you're satisfied growth, with the way things are, with the current restructuring, and the way that things have progressed over the past one year? I'm never satisfied with the way <laughs> things are. You know, I think that's hopefully one of our strengths, that we're never satisfied with the way things are. But they've moved constructively, they've moved forward. What are the shortcomings, if any? What are the areas that you would actually like work up, uh, to work on or the areas that you think still need to be beefed up with regards to the current restructuring that you've undertaken? I think we need to build more intimacy with the customer. I think we need to build more proactivity with our customers. I think we need to build our large customers larger in terms of selling multiple services into them and being much more proactive with them. Uh, I think we can be growing faster than what we are growing. Uh, and I think we need to invest more for the future and be less uh, sensitive to quarter to quarter pressures of the investors. But that is the nature of the game, isn't it? Every, everybody from analysts to the, st uh, to the stockholders, everyone is looking at the quarterly performance. Do you feel pressured, sometimes burdened even by Of course you feel by? pressured. Yeah? And you also feel pressured that sometimes you're making wrong decisions because of the pressure. Mm -hmm. But I think we're trying to get a via media and a balance which is still healthy. Some of the pressure is good because it gives you a lot of financial discipline. Some of the pressures is not good because it makes you sacrifice the kind of investments you'd have liked to make if the pressure was a little less intense. In hindsight, do you think that there's been some of the decisions that you've taken in the recent past on account of the quarterly pressure and things that you probably would like to redo? Broadly, no. 
I think uh, we have taken certain bets and most of those bets have seemed to have worked reasonably well. Uh, you'll always find some bets which have not worked well enough, but on an overall measure basis, I think we have done what we had to do. So are you willing to take more risks when it even comes to the Q on Q quarterly performance? Are you willing, are you willing to tell shareholders, well, this may not pay off in the next quarter, but this is a bet that we're going to make? Yes. You are? And how, soon are, we, how soon are we going to see this uh, panning out for the company? I think you're seeing it panning out now. You know, I mean, so you know, I don't think it's something which is incremental. I think we have set a direction. We're willing to make bets. And I think we will continue to set a direction where we're willing to make bets. Apart from the, the quarter to quarter phenomena that uh, the market is obsessive about, uh, a lot of people on the street, investment bankers, analysts, companies are also obsessed about the market cap game. How much of a difference does that make to you personally? How much do you track it personally? How important and significant is that to you personally? No, you track it because you must track, track it. Uh, and it, it's some measure of how you're doing and some measure of how you're not doing. But I think you can never get obsessed with it. I mean, if you get obsessed with it, you completely become dysfunctional. I don't think we are obsessed with it. Uh, and I don't think I'm obsessed with it. It's a good scorecard. And I think one should look at it as a good scorecard and not see it much beyond that. So when the scorecard is down a couple of thousand crores, does it make, uh, really. does, it, does it dent your confidence in where things are going for the company? Really. No, it doesn't. It doesn't bother you at all. I can't say it doesn't bother me at all. That'd be a dishonest statement to me. But, you know, that's the vagaries of the market. I mean, what was the reason for a market to fall 20% across the board? Have you learned now to And then to again go up another 10%. But are you now more comfortable no, with yes. the vagaries of the market as you were maybe 10 years ago? Oh, absolutely. Yeah? Much more comfortable. Uh, what about 2000 when the ADR listed? How significant a turning point was that for you personally and for the company as well? I think uh, an American listing break brings in another measure of discipline. Plus, I think it brings in a much higher focus on quarterly results because that's the way America runs. Uh, I think fortunately, Indian investors and particularly retail Indian investors are much more long term. Uh, so it brought a much more a quarterly accountability into the company. Fortunately, we had tried to build that culture for many years prior to that. So it was not such a major transition for us. And fortunately, we had a lot of internal disciplines on our financial system. So even the transition to getting a gap account uh, audited did not put much of a stress in the system. So all in all, it gave us a better visibility. It gave us, a, I think, a more thorough accountability and uh, gave us a little more confidence in terms of our initiatives on globalization. the critical challenges that is facing the IT industry and we've got all sorts of figures during the runs of about 2.3 billion dollars being spent over the next three years to train uh, you know new uh, people coming into the IT industry especially on the BPO front uh, any innovative ways that you've actually managed to tackle attrition because attrition has been fairly high even as far as Wipro is concerned we have been able to tackle it but not to our satisfaction you know it, attrition control is never to your satisfaction we would like to have attrition which is below 10 percent it's currently about, it about 20%. 12. We are running at about 12-13%. Okay. Uh, voluntary attrition. About 12% voluntary attrition. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it's leadership. And the most important investment you can make to have people continue with you and have people enjoy continuing with you is to see to that the supervisor is a good person as a supervisor. That is the fulcrum of all attrition, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. The rest are nice surrounds to it. I think they're important. Compensation is important, career options are important, training is important, uh, rotation of people is important. But I think at the fulcrum, the heart of the issue is the right supervisor. And supervisors are good at being supervisors. <laughs>
at the innovations that you brought about in the leadership style of the company. If you could take us through that, because uh, traditionally management practices in corporate India have been evol evolving over the years. We're trying to put in place best management practices and so on and so forth. But in Wipro, how much of that initiative did you sort of drive personally? I think the most important original initiative or innovation which we drove was bringing professionalism into a commodity business of oil purchase, oil trading, uh, manufacture of a finished product which was Vanaspati at that stage, which was a very commodity product. I think we were the first company probably in India who started inducting MBAs into oil trading mm -hmm. because we believed that it was to a very large extent a calculated judgment of when you buy and when you sell and any training mentally which gave you a discipline to be able to assess the pros and cons of it was just as valuable as experience. And we, we permeated that right into the company in terms of its professionalism. We invested a lot in people fresh from college. We invested a lot in training at a very early stage. We invested a lot in terms of leadership mentoring people. And that built a very strong backbone of people in terms of uh, supervisors, middle management and senior management, many of whom still continue with the organization. If you really see our top management of 70, 80 people, the majority of them have spent more than 10 to 15 years to 20 years with the company. So a lot of them who were with us in the 80s are still with us in the year 2000 on, which is really the backbone of the company. At the same time, I think what we did, and I think we did this well, we continuously inducted a certain number of senior management from outside mm -hmm. to be able to encourage a certain measure of cultural diversity and a certain measure of outside fresh thinking. And we have been successful as a company in being able to integrate a lot of senior management we have been taking from outside into the culture of the company and adapting to the best practices that they have brought in terms of culture. How it's do you been quite unique. It's made our culture much more porous mm -hmm. than many of our competitors. How would you say the culture of the company has evolved since 1945? The company is actually as old as you are. How do you think that the culture of the company, the ethos, the philosophy of the company has evolved over the years? I think we're far more customer oriented now because the nature of our business is service. And unless we put the customer right in front, we cannot be successful. So we're far more customer oriented. We are far more evaluation oriented. We measure what we do. We measure it all the time. We're a very measurement oriented company in the sense that we believe you cannot get results. You cannot get improvements. You cannot get excellence unless you're continuously measuring in terms of certain benchmarks and standards which you set for the self. How open are you to feedback, to criticism, to internal sort of uh, suggestions on the way that things should be run within the company? But that's inevitable in, in most leadership today. You know, but I you have a structured a... feedback process? Yes. We introduce uh, 360 degree appraisals for everyone starting with me probably about 13, 14 years back, much before it became fashionable. Mm. It's become very fashionable now. Mm. When we pioneered it, we were among the first companies to do it. So it's very much an ingrained part of our culture and we continue to do it on an annual basis. Mm. We just believe that the feedback is so valuable from a development point of view that uh, we should have an annual frequency so of that So what's feedback. the feedback that you've gotten personally about the strengths, the weaknesses, the possible changes? Well, one has to be more empathetic to people. Uh, one has to drive oneself less uh -huh. and work a little less. Uh, and one should take more risks. Are you a hard taskmaster? I suppose, you know, in a high growth company in terms of a very changing environment and a very uh, technologically uh, high end, you have to have very high standards. If you don't have very high standards, how do you build high standards across the company? But, uh, you know, speaking, you talked about risks. You seem to be, at least Wipro seems to be ahead of a lot of the other companies when it comes to making acquisitions, inorganic growth. You've got a, uh, you know, string of pearls philosophy, which seems to be working very well for the company. So why do you think you're risk averse? Or do you think at least the risk averseness has gotten better over the years? No, I think we could be taking more risks. You know, I think we have demonstrated quite a lot in the past eight, nine months, particularly in terms of some of the acquisitions we have been doing and particularly in terms of doing it to the frequency and the complexity at which we have done it. But uh, what people have not realized is that how much homework we have done before making that acquisition and how much learning we have got in terms of how do you do an integration of an acquisition well. I think all in all we seem to have done well. 
Uh, plus we have invested much more now in terms of uh, what we're building for tomorrow and what we're building for day after. But I still think we should be doing more. So has that message gone down to the core of the organization that you're a company at this point in time that's ready to take on more risks? Maybe 70% the message has gone down. 70%? People when are is, still watching. When is, when is 100% going to go down? Hopefully in six months. So is that going to lead to more inorganic growth? Is it going to lead to more innovations and more out-of-the-box ideas? I think ideas, it will or? lead to more uh, innovation. It will not lead to more inorganic growth because we are not looking at acquisitions as an aggregation strategy mm -hmm. on growth. We are looking at it as an expertise building process and getting very good local people in overseas countries in the front end. Sometimes you get them better through an acquisition than you can organically in terms of hiring them and building them. It's cut short time. So what kind of innovation would you like to drive through this 100% message that you're sending down, uh, almost like a thunderbolt? What is, the, what is the critical area that you feel the company at this point in time needs to fast track, move forward on? I think it's innovation. You know, we, we, we've had an innovation uh, process now for about six years. Uh, it's a structured process, you know, with, uh, with the innovation advisory board, innovation council, innovation champions, and innovation projects. We have more than 50 projects running on innovation. Uh, we have multiple centers of excellence. We have more than 40 centers of excellence which are embedded within our verticals. But what we have done in the past six months is uh, got into a new structured process which we call quantum innovation. Mm -hmm. Where we are using an external facilitator in terms of a consultancy company. And now we are putting our bets on five major quantum innovation projects which we have kicked off with dedicated teams full-time of our best people in areas which we think can make a significant difference going forward in terms of uh, large addition to revenue for the company. Mm -hmm. Innovation projects and business which we do today accounts for about 5% of our revenue which is about 100 million US dollars a year about 500 crores a year. Our target is in three years, in year three, to have it as 10% of our revenue. But will these be largely within the existing businesses, or could you look possibly beyond the existing businesses? It's within businesses? the existing businesses. Within the existing businesses. But they are, they are fairly lateral projects. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they are projects like, how can you completely increase your basket of recruitment? Mm -hmm. So that uh, the supply factor, which is a constraint today, does not become a supply factor three years from today. How do you go to third level engineering institutes, mm -hmm. as an example, and still be able to work proactively with them to get very high quality, semi-ready students, which you can induct into your process. So by when do we actually see results of this innovation, large-scale innovation project that you've just I taken us through? I think we start seeing results within the year. Within the year. And you've got a target of 10% by? By 2009. By 2009. March 2009. Year ending March 2009. That means a four-fold increase actually, because if you're growing at 30% a year, which the market is growing yeah. at, and you're going from 5 to 10%, you're talking about a four-fold increase in terms of uh, value. And is this going to be something that you're personally going to be spearheading? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Because we have regular sessions every eight weeks on it, mm -hmm. in terms of taking stock, in terms of how we are progressing. Information technology in India has existed and thrived for about three decades now. The journey that was kicked off by HCL Technologies, Wipro and Infosys has reached a point where the world symbolizes India with IT and software. Closely does Azim Premji monitor his comrades and rivals. In a strange coincidence that both Infosys and Wipro are com going to be completing 25 years of the IT business uh, practically within within the same period. How do you how do you rate your peers? What are your thoughts on your peers? Do you keep pace with what they're doing, with what they're not doing? What uh, do you keep pace with all of oh, that? Of course, you keep pace. Yeah. And uh, if they're better at you at certain things, you try to figure out how they're better, why they're better, and how you can be even better than what they are mm. at in those particular things. Mm. So we track our competitors all the time. I think we should be tracking our competitors even more thoroughly than what we are doing today. So if I were to say Infosys and ask you what you think personally are the biggest strengths for Infosys, what is, what is the formula that seems to have really worked for it? What do you think it would be? Well, I think it's a first-rate organization. Like I'm sure they think we are a first-rate organization. Uh, I think they have strong leadership. Uh, I think they have a good discipline of performance. And I think they are also investing for the future like we are investing. But how do you think you would differentiate Wipro for an emphasis or a Satyam? I think uh, you have talked about how you want to be more on the lines of an IBM and an Accenture, not really on the lines of an emphasis or a TCS. But what would you think are the main differentiators really in that sense? Well, you know, I think what uh, we have pioneered, which uh, we have been successful in, and we are fine-tuning it more as we go along, 
is organized by business solutions divisions. You know, we have a financial solutions division with the president and a whole structure under him. We have an enterprise solutions division or a, what we call a strategic business unit. We have an R&D strategic business unit. And we have uh, four buses which are horizontals, we service all of them. You know, it's the technology infrastructure services, the testing or interoperability services, and the enterprise application services. And a miscellaneous one which has certain very specialized services which run across all the business units. And I think that model has reached a certain maturity and a certain accountability, which distinguishes us from, I think, our other competitors who are not as matured in that model as we are and brings us closer to global leaders in the way we are able to approach a customer. I think, uh, and, and we have another horizontal, which is our business process outsourcing horizontal, which again services all the business units. I think we are also uh, more delegated in terms of profit accountability, vis-a-vis -vis these business units, than some of our other Indian competitors. I cannot say all of them, but I can say some of the other Indian competitors. And uh, we have been able to strategically build our domestic IT business mm -hmm. as a major incubation center for certain new services because of our strong presence here and our strong brand here. We've been able to pull together all the learnings of our domestic IT business mm -hmm. in services into our global business very, very successfully. One of the growth drivers for Wipro going forward is uh, is what the government is also betting on, is the SEZs. You've already won about uh, six approvals across India. How soon are we actually going to see your plans for the SEZs develop? And also, uh, government policy being questioned by some, being accepted by others on this matter. Where do you currently stand on the SEZ policy? No, we are okay on the SEZ policy. I think it has been articulated or re-articulated recently by a new committee which has been formed. And uh, it's going forward. Uh, but I think this whole issue of taxability of the software industry versus non-taxability of the software industry has been taken completely out of proportion. If you see the tax software industry today, which is in a tax-free uh, time period up to 2009, the average tax which an average software company in India is paying is about 16 to 17 percent. The average tax of the top 100 companies in India is about 20 percent because of various tax shields they've been able to get including going into Himachal Pradesh, going into Uttaranchal, etc. So I don't see what the issue really is. This is an export industry which is virtually 100 percent export right. and if that export industry is having an average tax rate of 16-17 percent and non-export industries in the top 100 are having tax rates of 20 and 21 percent, what is the real issue? So when are we going to see Wipro's development centers as part of the SEZ plans up and running? Well, they're up, already up and running. We have one up and running in Kolkata. You'll have the ones in Bangalore up and running in the next two weeks, three weeks. And you'll have the ones in Hyderabad as well as in uh, Cochin up and running very quickly. So are you looking at maybe other cities? Are you you absolutely. Looking? Yeah. So how many would you intend to in the next maybe two or three years or five years? Maybe in half a dozen more half a dozen more. So you've already got six and you're maybe looking at another six odd. Uh, so one of the other things that uh, one would like to talk to you about is Bangalore and the way that it is currently structured because it's been a sore point for most IT companies. You've gone on record uh, talking about the dismal state of the infrastructure. Are you going to continue with, uh, with trying to get the government to do something about it or are you taking matters into your own hands? No, I don't think it's a question of individual companies taking it up with government now. I think it's a question of a citizen's issue. Mm. I think there's a lot of back pressure building up on the government through common citizens because their commuting times have increased, their water supply is no longer hygienic, pollution levels have gone up. So it is a, it is a citizen issue, it's no longer a software issue versus the government. But if the infrastructure mess in Bangalore isn't sorted out soon enough, are Wipro's expansion plans going to be more outside of Bangalore and maybe in other areas like Kolkata where you've got the state actually backing infrastructure in a big way? It is already happening. Yeah. So I don't think there's anything new happening. Majority of companies which are in Bangalore now are trying to expand a significant part of their growth outside of Bangalore. One is because they want diversification in risk in terms of not having a concentration only in one part of the country. The second is that uh, there are a lot of incentives and attractions and uh, infrastructure investments which are taking place in other cities. So which would, be which, your your which would be your preferred destinations at this point in time? I don't think it's a question of preferred versus non-preferred. We are trying to set up centers in all areas 
where we have access to talent and we have access to decent infrastructure. So any center which has concentration of engineering colleges in and around becomes a target center. So we are virtually now expanding all over the country. There's no, no special partiality to any part of the country. It's in East India, in Kolkata. We just bought some land in Bhubaneswar, mm -hmm. in Orissa. Uh, we are expanding in parts of Delhi or Gurgaon, which is like Delhi. Uh, we would be expanding in, in Andhra Pradesh. Mm -hmm. We're setting up a center in Vaisak in addition to Hyderabad. We're expanding in, uh, in Chennai. Uh, we're trying to expand in Coimbatore. The government gives us land there. We're expanding in Kerala. Uh, we're expanding in Maharashtra. You know, we have a large base in Pune, which we are investing in to expand it further. Think of Vipro and you visualize just one man. What happens to Wipro after Premji decides to call it a day? One of the ultimate innovations possible is likely to be in the area of succession planning as far as Wipro is concerned. I know you very often say that in India people confuse ownership with management and that's really not the case and you don't need to uh, sort of give out the blueprint of, of the succession plan for Wipro because this isn't a reality TV show. But if you could just illustrate for us or give us a sense of how you plan to address that because in corporate India succession planning has been treated almost in a casual and a cavalier fashion. No, but succession planning is fundamental to a people, people business. You know, we have a very structured process of reviewing at a board level succession plans to the top 75 people in the organization in terms of who's ready, who's ready today, who's ready in the next two years, three years, and who's potential five years from today. That applies for my job also. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a regular drill process which goes on all the time. So if you're asking me whether there are identified successions to me in the organization, of course. We'd be a fool as an organization if we didn't have that as a systematically thought through process, which we review in depth with our board of directors at least once a year. We do it twice a year in terms of review in depth. And uh, we intend to keep improving on that process. Is there going to be a CEO anytime soon? Well, I'm the CEO for all practical purposes today. Uh, so when I decide to retire, there will be obviously a person who takes over from me. And your sons, I know one of your sons is working with the Azim Premji Foundation, uh, but any plans to bring them in in a formal fashion onto the company's board or onto the company itself? Any timeline set? Any targets on that front at all? No specific plans at this point of time. No or plans. if they are, we will not share them. <laughs> all right, sir. So final question to you, Mr. Premji, before we say goodbye to you on this uh, edition of Power Tax. Well, almost... 25 years, almost 60 plus years for the company. Where would you really like to see Vipro over the next five or 10 years? What do you think is the signature Azim Premji style that you would like to leave the company with? We certainly like to be among the top 10 global service providers in the world, both in terms of revenue size, in terms of profit size, and in terms of reputation. As an organization, the best people want to work with and the best people want to build a career with. We'd certainly like to be in the top five in terms of respect of our customers globally in the services field. We're getting there very quickly. In terms of uh, a customer goodwill, whereby customers would prefer to do business with us as compared to doing business with anyone else. And certainly in the top five in terms of a place where employees want to make a career. Mr. Premji, we wish you the very best of luck and thank you so much for taking time out to speak to us today. Pleasure talking to you today.